G'day guys. Somebody asked a question about tinnitus. Now, the funny thing is, a number of years ago, I sort of suffered very mild. Now and then, occasionally it would come and go and come and go. Um, it wasn't chronic or anything like that. It was a very mild, um, you know, it sometimes came, it seemed, with stress. Sometimes didn't for other reasons. I've got no idea. Sort of the driver's that were driving it within my physiology. And, I, and I, a lot of um, practitioners out there have a whole lot of myriad ideas about the etiology, which basically means we have no fucking idea what causes it. So there are a number of vectors, um, and I suspect there are structural things with some people and all sorts of uh, drivers that are actually affecting it, um, maybe even you know dietary you know, not, not good, basically, um, sort of getting blood into that area and oxygenation in that part or um, just vasodilation and stuff like that. So there, there seems to be a number of factors that could be driving it. Um, we don't really know. We've got no idea. We've got a lot of anecdotal evidence here and there, but nothing really solid that we can hand um, place our head on. But there are some things that have been identified that seem to have a positive effect. And so this was accidental the way I came across it. It's one of those things that um, I sort of forgot about and I just remembered recently when that person asked me the question. Because for the last couple of years, since I've been taking these two supplements, I have noticed zero um, tinnitus incidents. So... Now that's an N of one and I'm going to just show a bit of um, related science. Now I don't, I don't believe that that necessarily means that what I'm going to show that would cover every single instance. There could be variations. There could be a spectrum and you know, some of these things may help within that spectrum for some people. Some of them may not, or at least for those people who have way more severe forms, it may, it, reduce it at least that's something better than nothing so let me just share the screens and the studies that i came across a number of years ago and sort of uh, confirmed to me that these supplements that i was taking must be um, having a positive some sort of effect at least with me in that regard so they were these supplements I did take for the my cardiovascular reasons. They weren't taken for tinnitus, but it seemed to have a side benefit of basically eliminating the problem. Well, in my case, at least. Okay. Now, we all know what this wonderful thing is. It's called vitamin B3, my favorite vitamin. Niacin, exactly, guys. So as you can see, niacin has been shown to really help with a lot of things. Whether it's Bell palsy, Huntington's disease, migraines, chronic tension, type headaches, um, MS, um, Parkinson's, and our dear, and the one that we're concerned with today, which is tinnitus. Now, I'm not going to... If other people want to look at this study, it's a Canadian study and they can go away and take a look at it. And I will, and it's basically, you know, a review of the literature in a sense. So it's looking at the literature, what's available, what actually we've noticed in the literature. So let me just go down to the page with tinnitus there it is i'm not going to read all this you know so people want to look at it they can they can look at it and even they say it appears that no single treatment can help um with it with all forms so let's look at the actual this study that they actually refer to and treatment with um, B3, which is nice and we're talking about. In one study, 22 patients with tinnitus of multiple etiologies, multiple causes, um, were administered um, IV niacin, 
followed by oral niacin. Uh, 25 milligrams of IV niacin was administered to each patient and the dose was increased by five milligrams daily until the patient received 100 milligrams. Obviously they did that because we know what niacin does, gives you a lot of potential flushes, you know, those skin irritations and stuff like that, which I tend to suffer slightly, but I endure them because they do have a positive effect on a lot of things. So let's move on. Was administered to each patient? Yes, okay. Once the IV, um, uh, the IV dose reached 50 to 60 milligrams and 100, audiological tests were conducted to assess the pitch loudness of the tinnitus as compared with the tinnitus prior to niacin treatment. After reaching the maximum IV dose of 100 milligrams, all patients were given oral niacin, two tablets twice a day before meals, which amounted to a total daily intake of 400 milligrams. Each patient was examined clinically and auditorologically before niacin, very important, administration, and also at one month intervals uh, thereafter. Now, I just want to make one point. You've always heard that I've always, uh, always recommended that you shouldn't actually, it's not a good idea to go over 300 milligrams, um, like for long term at least. This was a short term, and obviously um, I think that's fine, and then you could probably drop, you know, once circumstances improved, you could drop a bit further down to the 250 mark for a, a longer period of time to see improvements. But anyway, that's just one because it does have an, a number of other effects, especially in very high doses, affecting gluconeogenesis, a number of things like polysis and a whole lot of other things, but usually it's over a thousand plus. So I never recommend higher doses than 300. Um, 400 isn't too bad, but I'll leave that up to your decision. If you suffer from tinnitus, what is more important to you and those choices, I can't make them for you. The study commenced on September 1952. And, you know, exactly. You know, this is how crazy it is. These we've known for, you know, how long? We're talking about 48 and 20, 68 years. That's a long time. So it's not as if some of this information doesn't exist, but this is the problem with a lot of, um, there's a lot of research that does, but a lot of the stuff, most people don't have any idea about out there. And the period of observation um, of the 22 patients was about 18 months. So it takes a lot, quite a long period, you know, they, they were doing it. Of the 22 patients with tinnitus, 15 patients, which is 68.2%, benefited from um, niacin treatment. The authors were surprised that the niacin treatment helped only uh, help such a diffuse symptoms as tinnitus with multiple etiologies. So they were surprised to find that even though these people had multiple reasons for having tinnitus, you know, um, so from their own diagnosis, their initial diagnosis, which they would have asked these people a number of questions, you know, and things that would trigger these sort of things or the type, whether it was chronic, whether it was mild, whether it came and went and stuff like that, those different, they still noticed that, uh, you know, um, that a number of these people with a number of different symptomatology or sort of drivers um, seem to basically, you know, do quite well. So it wasn't a specific that it actually targeted a specific type of uh, um, uh, tinnitus or a specific category or group of people that affected. So that's interesting, you know. 68.2% is definitely not 100%. It's not a cure. But, you know, I suspect the others would have got some. This is group that actually had quite a lot of benefit others for maybe genetic, uh, maybe their lifestyle factors, maybe their diet, maybe a number of other factors may be confounding the, the effects. So some of the others, so today people on a very bad diet may not get the same effects because, you know, they're so dysregulated. So really, even if you're taking 
this, it may not work as, as well if you're causing quite severe blood flow issues and all sorts of stuff from a bad diet. So, yes. So there's a number of reasons why it, it may, if you want to take the same doses today, if you've got a number of underlying um, pathologies, um, comorbidities and stuff like that, it may not be as effective. This was done in 52 when people were a hell of a lot healthier than today. Anyway, let's move on. The authors were surprised. Exactly what I've already said. Ah, okay. They attributed these favorable results to the vasodilatory effects of niacin, which was thought to normalize blood flow in the labyrinth and the osmotic pressures. They further speculated that the many different causes of tinnitus lead to secondary vascular problems. So as you can see, again, vascular problems, heart, you know, people with strokes, all these sort of things. It's not surprising that tinnitus is going through the roof in recent times. I think it is tied to our diet. It is tied to our general health because people actually were affected by noise in the past, far more, especially people that were working in industrial sites you know, they would have been exposed to far more. My father was a boilermaker welder, exposed to quite a lot of noise and actually had damage to one of his eardrums because of the constantly banging with a, with a hammer, you know, to, you know, the, the flakes that you actually knock off from the welds and all that. Anyway, so I would, I would say, and he doesn't suffer from tinnitus, where me with my poorer diet have, and I wasn't a boilermaker welder. So um, I think the rise is probably vascular. These guys were speculating back then, but I think they were probably on the money. Okay, let's move on, which is why niacin may, was able to help many of the, the tinnitus cases having multiple etiologies. And the type of um, uh, tinnitus was res responded the best to niacin treatments where of the cryptogenetics and um, miniforms varieties. Okay, so different types. You love how they use all these terms. In a double um, blind placebo control trial, um, niacinamide or placebo was given to 48 patients with tinnitus. There were no differences in the treatment outcomes between niacinamide and placebo. So as you can see, basically the vitamin B3 that you buy in the soup in the, you know, in the, you know, the normal standard, which is the niacinamide type does nothing. You need niacin. That's what the body uses. So that's what you need. It is surprising that the authors of this study thought niacinamide would help since the vasodilatory effects of niacin are likely responsible for its beneficial effects on tinnitus. So basically, niacin is basically, or in the form that I take it, which is nicotinic acid, is in the form which is um, what you'll find in food. So animal foods, particular. Um, so we're talking about liver, we're talking about things like tuna, you know, and a number of other, um, uh, you know, animal foods. So you can go away and actually check those for yourselves um, in that regard. We will move on to the next part. The key. Next. Okay. The effects of supplementary dietary taurine on tinnitus and auditory discrimination in animal models. Now, this is 23 pages. I'm not going to go through this. People want to look it up. I'll put a link. They can look it up. Okay. This was done in um, the US. Um, and basically, I will read the abstraction and people can go and take a look at it. Loss of central inhib inhibition has been hypothesized to underpin tinnitus and impact auditory acuity. Taurine, a partial antagonist at inhibitory glycine and G amino butyric acid receptors was added to the daily diet of rats. So this is a rat study 
to examine its effects on chronic tinnitus and normal auditory discrimination. Eight rats were unilaterally exposed once to loud sound to induce tinnitus. The rats were trained um, and tested in an apparent task shown to be sensitive to tinnitus. An equivalent unexposed control group was run in parallel. Months after exposure, six of the exposed rats showed significant evidence of chronic tinnitus. So they induced, this is why you, you know, it's a mammalian model. It's not a dietary where people have different dietary um, sort of, uh, you know, animals, you know, metabolize foods or things differently. So yes, but when it comes to things like this, our ears, you know, have evolved, all mammals have very similar structures. So they, we have evolved very similar features. So mammals have very, a lot of similarities and number of structures. So in that regard, this animal model for a specific type, which is unconfounded, you know, is, is something which is more applicable to us rather than the dietary stuff, which is, has multiple confounding. Here's just one. They induced um, this problem and then they did something, they did an intervention like you would do in a clinical study, but you can't do it on humans. You can't basically cause ear damage to people and then try to correct it in a study. You'd never get past an ethics committee. So anybody that tells you that. So this is all we've got, animal studies, when it comes to these animal models, unfortunately. Um, yes, unless some dictator comes into power and starts experimenting on humans again, we may get some new information, but that's not going to happen. Um, so two concentrations of taurine in the drinking water were given over several weeks, um, attaining average daily dose of 67 milligrams per kilogram and 294 milligrams per kilogram. Water consumption was unaffected. So it didn't seem to affect any of the other parameters. Um, three main effects were obtained. One, the high taurine dose significantly, the, significantly attenuated tinnitus, which returned to near pre-treatment levels with um, following washout. So these little buggers actually got back to their pre-damaged levels. Pretty good. So auditory discrimination was significantly improved in unexposed control rats at both dosages as indicated by levels of um, uh, pressing taurine at both doses had significant group equivalent stimulant effects. These results were considered with a hypothesis that taurine attenuates tinnitus and improves auditory discrimination by increasing inhibitory tone and decreasing noise in the auditory pathway. So basically these people were able to induce and reverse. And in particular, we saw the best results in the higher doses. So what would that be in a human equivalent? So the low, the, the other one that actually showed it as well, good effects, 67 times, let's say this would be a 150 pound person, about 70 kilos times 70. We're looking at 4,700 milligrams. Okay. So it's sort of the, the level that some of the bodybuilders get up to five grams of taurine, um, which is sort of doable. At higher rates, it does lower blood pressure. So people need to be very careful, especially if they're on blood pressure medication or have other like low blood pressure issues or whatever. It, you know, you gotta be very careful. Maybe a, slow, a lower dose, like one or two milligrams over a long period of time with niacin, is probably safer for you if you've got those sort of issues of low blood pressure and other related issues or you're on blood pressure meds, you know, that really restricts how far you can go with this protocol. So you may need first to come off the blood pressure meds before you can start looking at something like this because it does reduce blood pressure a lot. And I don't want people, fight, you know, passing out or even worse, you know, you know, causing themselves, you know, mm major problems. So you need to basically, um, you've got the information, you can take the studies, go to your doctor, 
and make appropriate decisions of how you will implement these things. So this is not medical advice. It's just basically my, what I've done. I don't take any blood pressure medication. I don't take any of this sort of stuff. I don't take um, any meds. And so I use these methods. So for me to take, and I was taking basically about three grams of, um, of basically taurine and still sort of now take about two grams. So even at two grams, it hasn't come back with the niacin and two grams, it seems to be still doing the trick. So, you know, but that's up to you how you, you manage that side. The, the top end, which is really high, 294 times, let's see, 70, 150 pound person, 70 kilos, is up to six and a half thousand. So that is really high. That's even higher than many of the bodybuilders would consume, which is I think their maximum about five that they take. Some of them, not all of them, it depends. But I've heard that some people take up to five of taurine. Um, they try because it also it's an amino transporter. So these guys are trying to shove as much protein into their muscles as possible. So that's why they do it. Okay, they don't do it for any other reason. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, that's a sort of bit of a rundown on the um, you know on this issue and some of the information we've got. Um, we don't have like definitive stuff. We don't have like, you know, the perfect cure or anything like that, but we can, you know, at least seem to reverse it in rats and seem to lower it. Um, so what's applicable to rats isn't exactly applicable. Remember, this is not long-term tinnitus. This is short-term induced tinnitus. So there's a difference between long-term and short-term and then how much damage you've done over that period with, let's say, you know, inappropriate diets, two, three decades of inappropriate diets, reducing the amount of blood flow to different parts of your brain and stuff like that in the peripheral tissue. You know, have you got peripheral neuropathy or stuff like that? Well, you're going to have less blood flow. So it may take much longer with niacin to deal with that blood flow issue. So, you know, these things help. The amount of period of time, I mean, the nice one was about um, 18 months. This one was much shorter, but that's a rat model. And rats, remember, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, a couple of months with rats, you know, it's the equivalent of a very much longer. So that was a month after exposure. So, you know, the we're, we're talking about the maximum of humans is about 100. So rats is about, without any sort of intervention, it's about two, divided by two, that's 50 fold times, it will, that's 50 months divided by 12, that's the equivalent of four years. So in human years, it's about four years. So doing this intervention, and from my own experience, I noticed that, um, it probably, because I started about nine years ago doing nice and doing touring and all that. And I probably was, you know, about four years ago um, that all these things ceased completely. So, you know, I can't remember exactly. It's a long time ago. So don't hold me to it. But all I can say is that you're looking at it sometime. It's not going to ha happen immediately like with the rats. So it will take some time in the human lifespan. So, you know, give it a try. Um, you've got nothing to lose, but if you are taking blood pressure meds, you've got to be very careful with basically taurine and dosages and stuff like that. You may have to make adjustments, consult your doctor and work out some sort of plan to help you in that area. Anyway, hope this provides some information for you guys to you know, do your own research. Um, this is my opinion of an N of one, um, some of the science that I've come across um, that's actually sort of uh, informed me about potential um, therapeutics. But you have to basically, um, you know, it's in your ball court, how you manage and what, how you approach it and what you do about it. Anyway, the chigoos, see ya.